As our faces and perspectives differ, so is the sound of our voices. Welcome to Voices, a production of the Atlantic Caribbean Union of Seventh-day Adventists, headquartered on the Isle of New Providence within the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have on purple today. Yes, it signifies royalty, but it is also one of two colors for the Women's Ministries Department within our church. Now, I have this on because the children of Miss Brenda and today we are focusing on empowering women so ladies get your daughters call your sisters all of your female friends gentlemen stay put because this information that we have is relative to you in studio today we have one of the most vivacious and real speaking individuals that I have ever ever encountered. Her name is Sister Linda Anderson. Sister Linda, it is such a pleasure and privilege to have you in our studios today. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for consenting to be here. I know that you could have been anywhere, but God put you here Amen. to speak to the women at our recent Women Ministries Retreat. Now, for those that were not there, who really missed that treat? Oh, I Can, wish I'd met them. Yes. Well, they're, they're here now in spirit. Amen. Can you please just give them just a snippet as to who the book of Linda Anderson is? Well, I guess the book of Linda Anderson is still being written, mm -hmm. uh, but the chapters so far um, are just like any other book that contains uh, some triumph and some tragedy, um, some love and some pain. Uh, joy and some sorrow, but ultimately it contains um, faith, trust, and deliverance by a God who um, is active in every area of our lives. So I guess my book, I'm hoping that the final chapter will be the one where I not only lose weight, <laughs> <laughs> but where I will uh, meet the Lord in the air. And um, that is what I'm striving for. That's what I'm working toward hearing him say, well done, my good and faithful servant, well Amen. done. Amen. Amen. Now, Sister Linda, I had the privilege, as I said, of sitting, sitting in on at least three of your sessions oh, during this weekend. Beautiful. And one of the things that really struck me, outside of the fact that, yes, you're the dean at Oakwood University mm -hmm. and you're a mom, mm -hmm. but you are a very confident woman. Oh, my. And um, one of the things that I think I, I really would like us to discuss is self-esteem. Yes. A lot of women, not just young women, suffer from this. Low self-esteem. Yes, yes. 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 And so we, I, I just want you to talk to us just a little bit on the cohesion between Christianity and having a high self-esteem. Yes, I think that's important. Um, one of the things that I always share with, with women whenever I have the opportunity, even young girls, is the fact that as Christians, we should not have low self-esteem. Why? Uh, because the God of the universe cared enough about us, loved us enough to send his son to die for us. So essentially, God thinks we're to die for. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anybody who would ever feel that if somebody wanted to die for them, that they weren't important. The God of the universe says, you're so special, I so love you, that I'm going to send my son who's flawless, guiltless, to die for you. That should be the catapult for our self-esteem. It should lift us. It should encourage us. And if that's not enough, the fact that he's preparing a place for us because he wants to be with us, that as a Christian should be our motivator uh, to say, you know what? I am something. I am somebody. I do count. I do matter. And the bottom line is we have put so much importance on looks and whether or not we have the affections of man, and I don't mean men, the gender, I mean mankind. We are so interested in what people think about us that we fail to recognize the significance of what God thinks about us. And there are going to be times in your life when people may not even like you, right. but God loves you. And more than that, he likes you. And I think that's important. I was reading a book by an individual by the name of Brendan Manning, um, and it is called The Wisdom of Tenderness. And in the book, he talked about how the fact that God loves us is no big secret. We know that because God is love. Mm -hmm. But the fact that God likes us is something entirely different. Sometimes you love your family, even though you don't really like them. Very true. You have to love them because they're family. But if you like them, that says something entirely different. 
God likes me. That should make me feel like all that and two bags of chips. Um, so I want, I guess, we as women to accept the fact that we're beautiful, regardless of how we look on the outside. We're beautiful because we're made in God's image and he loves us. And that should lift our self-esteem, not lower it. Sister Linda, you made the Bible sound like a romance novel oh, just now. It is. It is such it a beautiful is. thing. Now, the, as we transition into feeling beautiful and realizing our self-worth, the topic for this weekend was fulfilling my purpose. Yes. And I do believe that there were a number of women there that were, that were really that may have needed to hear that just kind of one more about time. Their purpose yes. And, mm -hmm. and so as we go from self esteem and we're feeling beautiful, there are those now we're gonna talk about the D word that we often don't mm -hmm. talk about in church. Divorce. Yeah. We whisper. We it. whisper because we don't ever want to talk about it. But divorce is such a taboo topic. However, but yet it it's, is, it's, it's impacting there. our church, yes. It, it is, is there in the Christian church mm -hmm. and not just in the Seventh-day yes, Adventist church. church. And so I just want you to possibly give some advice to the engaged couples or even mm -hmm. those who are single. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think that um, engaged couples need to really know each other. Um, one of the things that I advocate for is counseling uh, before marriage because you wouldn't enter into any contract without first reading it and researching mm -hmm. what it is that you were contracting. Uh, and in marriage, it's the same thing. You need to really know some things about your spouse. And some of those things will not become evident unless you sit down with a neutral party or a pastor or someone and you begin to discuss the nuts and bolts of the marriage. Um, love is an emotion, uh, it feels good. Mm -hmm. But what is going to happen uh, when you find out that your spouse has anger issues or your spouse-to-be has anger issues? What is going to happen uh, when you find out that uh, your spouse has daddy issues, didn't have a relationship with mom or dad? When these things become evident in the marriage, it's almost fatal. But you could find out some of these things during the relationship, mm -hmm. during the courtship. And if you knew these things ahead of time, you could either A, opt to continue and right. get some help and work on repairing those broken places, or you could decide, you know what, this isn't for me. But once you've married, I think a lot of times people find things out in marriage that they didn't know prior to marriage. And that's why the rate of divorce is so high. You married someone you really didn't know. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the attraction and the affection are just parts of the whole package. You have to have everything lined up and in order. And I think that counseling is one of the ways that you find these things out. Prayer is very significant. Worship is significant. Because if you want God to bless all that you do, you need to involve him in all that you do. And he has to be the unseen partner in this relationship. Um, and so for individuals who are on the, the precipice of marriage, mm -hmm. they're uh, thinking or contemplating marriage, I encourage you to have counseling, involve God in your relationship. But then for those who have already entered into marriage, um, the wording is till death do us part, but that doesn't mean homicide. Mm -hmm. And so what you need to do is Find a counselor again if you're already in a bad relationship and you realize it's a bad relationship. Seek help. Try to find someone who's neutral. You don't want to go to someone that you know and you are very close with, who is close to both you and this individual, because there may be biases. Mm -hmm. But you need to find someone neutral who is spiritual, spiritual, and seek help. Um, I also encourage couples who are going through problems, you don't tell your family everything. Because you may tell your parents or your sisters or brothers all of these horrible things about your spouse, and then you forgive the spouse, but mm -hmm. guess what? They won't they forgive so readily. So you need to make sure that you are keeping your relationship, just that, your relationship. There should be some privacy issues 
and confidentiality clauses mm -hmm. that we adhere to. And I don't mean if you're in an abusive relationship. If you're in an abusive relationship, everybody needs to know that because somebody needs to help you out. Right. Um, but if you're in a relationship where there are difficulties of a social nature um, or spiritual nature, get help. And then for those who find at some point that the marriage is not going to work because there are going to be those as well. Sometimes marriage doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a harsh thing to say, but sometimes it doesn't. And one of the reasons is because we keep thinking that God is going to salvage something that he didn't put together in the first place. That's a key point. You know, sometimes we ask God to bless something that he didn't even ordain. Mm -hmm. you, you ordained it. That's right. So if the inevitable happens and you don't work out, once again, seek God on that. It's a difficult road to walk as a divorced person. I know this personally, mm -hmm. but I do know that God even has salvation for us. If we seek him and if we go to him with a contrite heart that says, God, I need you, he does answer our prayers too. Amen. Thank you for that, that comforting note for everyone. Yes. Now, you spoke about married couples. You spoke about those that are divorced. Now, what about single people? Oftentimes, we are told that you are never complete mm -hmm. until you have a mate, or the only or man That's should funny. yeah man should not be alone. But I read in some instances that there are some type of men Paul until they are ready, yeah. they need to be alone. Yeah. So, can a single woman be complete? She already is. Um, I don't know any woman who's half. <laughs> I don't think that God created half people. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that be interesting to see someone hopping around with one arm and one leg? Right. <laughs> um, I think we are complete. I think that a marriage is between two complete people. Two holes make a, a whole. It's not two halves. When I hear people say, this is my better half, you are a whole on your own. You just make a better whole together sometimes. And um, I think that the single person has to realize a couple of things. First of all, we have to find joy in whatever state we're in. Like Paul said, I've, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. Um, because there is a possibility that there may not be that perfect person that you'll be able to find. So there may be some instances where people just don't marry. Um, and you have to find a way for God to make you feel complete. The Bible says, let patience have her perfect work so that we can be complete, wanting nothing. You have to be patient with God, patient with yourself, patient with the process of life. Um, but the other wonderful thing that I've discovered is, yes, uh, God said it's, it's not good that man should be alone. And we always take that to mean that it's a person of the opposite sex. We're supposed to be married. Mm -hmm. But friendships, uh, close ties with siblings, close ties with other church members, those are relationships, too, that make us feel uh, complete. Um, I once did a, a, a workshop for some young women in Seattle, Washington, where I was living uh, for a while. And I did some research on uh, friendship and, and togetherness and people uh, forming partnerships. And they, they showed in the study that if a person put their foot, they asked the person to put their foot in a, a bucket of ice water and see how long they could keep it in the bucket. And when they took it out, they timed it. Then they had the person with another person, both of them each put their foot in their own bucket of ice water and together they could keep their foot in that ice water longer. Mm. And that shows that when we go through things, even painful things, if we have someone to go through it with us, mm -hmm. It just makes it that much easier. So I encourage people who are waiting to find the right person, form some friendships, because it's not good that man should be alone. Right. But friendship is the answer to that as well. And the Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than and a brother. brother yes. So yes, I think that being single, you can be complete, but you can also have friends that can help you feel less alone. And I think too, even just 
in for formulating that relationship with Christ. Yes. Having he's, that alone. He's the, the main person that you want to relate to. You want to have a relationship with him first. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, the time is really winding down. We are already going to take a quick break. Do not, do not go anywhere. We still have so much more to discuss with Sister Linda. Until then, stay tuned. Welcome back to Voices. We have been having such a wonderful and beautiful discussion with Sister Linda Anderson. Sister Anderson, we left with you just providing hope to a complete single lady. Mm -hmm. And now I just want us to discuss just a bit on the Christian lady and their attire. Mm, kindly, interesting topic. Yes, it always is in the <laughs> church. <laughs> Can you kindly provide your thoughts on that topic alone, the Christian lady and dress. Uh, people often say um, uh, you can't look like a Christian um, and that dress really shouldn't have anything to do with uh, whether or not you're a decent person or any of that. But the truth of the matter is we um, assign certain responsibilities to individuals who go for interviews and they dress in a certain attire uh, to make their employer feel that they are fit for this position. Well, as a Christian, I think that it shouldn't be any different. I think that the Christian should have a way of carrying him or herself. I think that we shouldn't emulate um, certain segments of the world because they're, they're, the view will become blurred. And mm -hmm. the Bible says, whatever you do, you should do it as if unto the glory of God. I've never known that you could be half naked to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do believe that as male and female, we have a certain amount of responsibility to dress as though we have self-respect mm -hmm. um, because we certainly can't make people respect us because we can't get in their head and affect their mind. Right. But we can have self-respect and I think that the self-respecting person carries him or herself in a way that makes the world know I have an image that I want to uphold and that's one of someone who loves God and who has um, a certain set of beliefs, and my dress reflects that. And people may dispute it. That's okay. I'll keep my clothes on. Right. I'll keep my clothes on. <laughs> that is right. I find it to be very interesting, too, because, you know, sometimes people say that the way you dress is how people perceive mm -hmm. you, whether or not that is how you are. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate the fact that, yes, you are a Christian, you are God's child, and so you should look the part. And I don't think that we, uh, as women specifically, should have to um, advertise anything. I think that we're beautiful, and I think so often, especially with the new coming generations, uh, millennials and gen Generation X, um, so often the feeling is that I have to show people how beautiful I am, mm -hmm. and I want to demonstrate how beautiful, you don't owe anyone anything. Let them find out how beautiful you are through the way you conduct yourself, the things you say, the way you behave. Um, the package isn't necessarily the contents. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you need to make sure that what's on the inside is beautiful. And then those um, who get to know you on a more personal level, the husband, right. hopefully, <laughs> he'll be able to see that um, the, the packaging and the contents Match up. Match. Mm -hmm. Now, Sister Anderson, I had mentioned earlier that you are the Dean of Women at Oakwood University yes, in the Huntsville. Dean of freshman women. Freshman. I'm enjoying it. Yes. How is that going for you? Oh, it's you? beautiful. It's beautiful. I have 250 young women with whom I live mm. uh, in the residence hall. And I remember my daughter saying, Mom, I want siblings and <laughs> I want a sister. And so when I took the position at Oakwood University, um, I said, you Brooke, made. you now have 250 sisters. What a Are you happy? She said, that's not exactly what I meant, Mom. 
<laughs> but in that, we do have a number of young women, young men that will be mm. going off to school, yes. that are preparing for school, that are in school now, that are watching yes. this program. And I hope many of them will be coming to Oakwood. Amen. <laughs> what type of advice, though, what type of guidance can you give to the students that are preparing for a college or are freshmen? Mm -hmm. um, and wherever they're going, uh, my advice would be to go prepared to have strength to say no to some things. Because anywhere you go, there is always going to be temptation. But you want to make sure that you are not led in a direction that God is not leading. And so often, uh, when young people go away to college, they have this certain air of independence. And with that, uh, they make some choices that are, are poor. So I encourage young people to make sure you have strength enough to say no to some things. And when you're making friends, make sure that you take on friends who elevate mm -hmm. and who don't bring you down. A friend is not somebody who encourages you to do things that you have to do secretly. A friend is someone who elevates you in your existence, who uh, brings a benefit to your relationship. So be careful of the friends that you make. And then lastly, don't forget that you have a family name to protect. Right. So behave yourself in a way that your parents and your loved ones and your family can be proud. There are just as many people who want to see you fail and succeed, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Don't be entertainment for those who want to see you fail. Well, amen. I will take notes definitely amen. with that. Um, you recently gave a presentation about Ruth Gleaning, mm. and um, you gave your testimony about losing a loved one. And I was privy to that testimony, mm. and I can say it touched me. Now, as we all know, October is... Cancer, Breast cancer Awareness, awareness Month, yes, yes. ma'am. And there are many who are suffering with this. Mm. And so I'm just wondering if you would be able to bring some level of comfort to someone who has faced or is currently going through that journey of beating and overcoming cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, it's ironic that today I was sitting in the hotel, restaurant, and there was a woman seated next to us and we started conversation. Uh, my mother taught us to know no stranger. Mm. And as we were talking, uh, the woman shared with me that she was here for her aunt's funeral. And while at the funeral, she found out that her sister had died of breast cancer. She was planning to visit her after the funeral. And I went from eating to ministering because I realized that that's why God had me in that restaurant. Mm -hmm not for the croissants, but for this <laughs> opportunity to talk with this woman. And I told her that um, it's a painful thing. There's no, there's no way around the pain. But what I wanted her to take away from that was that God will go through it with her. And God is the buffer between us and the pain. It would be far worse if he were not part of our process. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. And he said that those are of a broken heart. He's near to them. So I told her, rest in him. The other part to that, the caveat, is that we are going to go through some difficult things in life. It's part of life. We live in a world of sin. I've, I've lost four siblings uh -huh. and both my parents, and every loss was painful. My sister died at 55 of cancer. But what God kept reminding me was that all of this is temporary. This is temporal. And if we can make it through this, there's the opportunity for eternity. And if we can somehow survive this loss, we survive it with the knowledge of the fact that this doesn't have to be the end. That God himself is preparing a place for us to be reunited with our loved ones. So the goal on this side of heaven is to encourage all of our loved ones to accept Christ. So that if we should suffer this kind of loss, it's going to be painful, but there's the opportunity of being reunited with our loved ones. And in that we take comfort. And I encourage people who are going through the painful sickness of cancer to rest in God, trust him and realize that if somehow healing is not the answer that we have prayed for, but we do not receive, if we don't receive that healing, God has something far better than healing. He has restoration. When my brother was dying, we prayed that God would heal him. He was 43, and we prayed all weekend. On the sixth day, 
he didn't, he didn't survive. And at his funeral, we realized that he brought more people to church at his mm. funeral than he ever had an opportunity to in his life. And when he finally passed away that, that Friday evening, his pain was gone. Mm -hmm. He rested on he the rested Sabbath. On Sabbath. And his pain was gone. When my father died, his pain was gone. Sometimes we have to recognize that when we're asking for God to heal, he takes it a step further and he saves. Be encouraged. And weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. Uh, find someone to grieve with you. But trust God to bring healing. He said he wouldn't leave us comfortless. That is right. And he's honest. God is a man of his word. He cannot lie. Wow. Thank you so much. Amen. Because I do know personally, I lost my great grandmother I'm to so colon cancer a few so years sorry. ago. And um, even now, my family still has difficulty it's with it. And I, I just like the fact that you're telling us that it's okay. You must grieve. It's, you must it's grieve. It's okay. And um, the Bible also tells us this, that those that sow in tears will reap in joy. Amen. And weeping may endure for a night. But, but joy is coming. coming. It's morning. morning, Lord. Yes. It's morning. Let us have some joy. And, you, and, and the wonderful thing about joy is that joy can live, um, can cohabitate with sorrow. You can have joy and sorrow. Happiness is fickle. Mm -hmm. It's connected to our experience but joy is that thing deep inside that's there regardless of what's going on. So I ask God for joy rather than happiness because happiness might decide tomorrow when I lose my job that happiness is leaving it's because gone. you have no yes. income. But joy is going to hang around. Joy is steadfast because God gives joy and it's deep inside. So search for that joy inside and remember the wonderful things about that loved one. And they wouldn't want you to sorrow forever. They want you to have joy. Remember that. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Sister Anderson. As we begin to wrap up, you recently spoke at the Atlantic Caribbean Union's ministry, Women's Ministries Retreat, and you spoke on the theme, Fulfilling mm. My Purpose. Yes. How does a person fulfill their purpose? And I want to take it a step further. When he or she is feeling separated from God. <laughs> um, that title, that theme, Fulfilling My Purpose, was captivating for me because I've always, I've long wanted to fulfill the purpose of God. And sometimes we think that our purpose has to be something big and grand with flashing lights and whistles. And sometimes your purpose is simply to encourage someone. Sometimes your purpose is simply to uh, be the support mechanism for something bigger. Sometimes your purpose is big, sometimes your purpose is small, and even when you are separated or feeling separated from God, you have to recognize, first of all, you may have let go of God, but he'll never let go of you. So even when we feel separated, he's still there. The first step toward fulfilling our, pro our purpose is obedience. Obey God. Obey him in the small things because those things are what lead us to the bigger things. If you can just, even though you feel separated from him, he said he's, he's not far away, ask him, please let me feel your presence. And then say, God, what would you have me to do? Be like little, little Samuel mm. who said, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. First step, obey God. Second step. Let him order your steps and follow in the way he leads. And recognize that sometimes the shortest route to your purpose may be on a rough and rocky road, but he'll walk it with you. He'll walk it with you. So to fulfill your purpose, obey God. Obey God. I think that is a beautiful note to end this discussion on. And I just want to thank you so much for the ministry oh that you have given to all of us that thank are watching. You. Thank you. Especially to us that were, that are here now, just taking in your presence and your words and your encouragement. I want we people want, to be encouraged. Yes, we want to encourage you to, to continue doing this. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. This has been a production of the Atlantic Caribbean Union. And I just want to encourage you 
to seek God in fulfilling your purpose. Until next time, I am Siobhan Sherman, and we are happy that you watched. Mm -hmm.